got a wonderful presentation tonight on measuring cosmic distances. This question comes up a lot during outreach. I'm just going to read a little bit to kind of give you the, the, the background on the talk and a little bit about Bill. So bear with me. Uh, when we're at the when we're at a dark sky area looking into the night sky, as beautiful as it may be, we are essentially seeing it only in 2D. Uh, the bright stars do seem a bit closer, but is that really the case? Uh, ancient Greek philosophers recognized the 2D appearance of stars. In this model universe, uh, Aristotle, uh, well-known Greek, placed the stars on the inside of a crystal sphere, a fixed distance from the Earth from which they re revolve. So if you remember the uh, celestial sphere, that's what we uh, started out with. We now know much more about the universe than Aristotle ever would have imagined. Uh, learning to measure cosmic distances was one of the keys that unlocked this knowledge. And it's one of the more remarkable achievements of modern astronomy. Uh, Bill Spazeri will take us on a journey of discovery as he describes how modern astronomers measure cosmic distances. He will touch on the history of discovery and describe some of the science behind the measurements. A little bit about Bill. Uh, Bill is a retired uh, computer software engineer who has been studying astronomy for over 65 years. His favorite thing to do is to teach astronomy to the public, especially the youngsters. Uh, he has been doing that more or less continuously for over 40 years. Uh, he now does it in the Houston area schools and community centers. Uh, the pay is excellent in the form of great questions from the students. So with that, I'd like to uh, uh, turn the uh, presentation over to Bill. Um, as always, as Bill is um, making his presentation, if you would uh, mute your microphone and uh, put any questions that you may have for Bill in the chat, uh, we'll collect those. And at the uh, when Bill's complete, we'll um, go through those. So without further ado, uh, let me welcome uh, Bill Spaziri. Thank you. Okay, uh, cosmic distance measurement. I didn't have a pr presentation like this. A, a local teacher said she wanted to teach that to her class. So I put this presentation together a couple of years ago and I've given it many times. Um, so uh, we'll get started here. Uh, so, uh, the task of doing of measuring cosmic distances is called astrometry. Okay, that might be easy for you to say, but uh, basically it means measuring the stars. Okay, so um, uh, on that subject, you know, going back, as was mentioned a minute ago, 1000 BC, all the way up until the 1800s, it was thought that all the stars were at the same distance. Okay, then in 1838, an astronomer uh, named uh, uh, Frederick Bessel uh, figured out using a, a technique called parallax, which we will discuss in detail later, found out that this one star 6160 was 10 light years away. And then that was kind of the beginning of astrometry, measuring cosmic distances as we know it today. So uh, here's a diagram of what uh, Chris was alluding to. You, of course, had Earth in the center of the universe. Uh, and next was the moon and Mercury and Venus and the sun was going around the earth. Okay. Which uh, caused a lot of trouble. And then uh, this here is that crystal sphere with the stars around it. All right. That was the view of uh, mo many thousands of years ago until the 1800s. And this picture on the right, I don't know why this is there, but I just, it was, it, it's an interesting way of, of a guy trying to figure out uh how the universe was created and uh, maybe how far away the stars were and what was beyond them. So um, that was the ideas of cosmic measurement a long time ago. So uh, uh, you're going to learn tonight that the, uh, you have to use different kind of tools to measure different things. Okay. Uh, as you can see here, many different tools, they don't measure the same kind of things. Well, with the, cos with the cosmos, uh, the same rule applies. And uh, space is big. Okay. As they said in that uh, movie, I forget what the movie was. Anyway, space is really, really big. And consequently, with the uh, uh, the size of space, we end up having to use many, many different tools to measure it. And so not only is space really big, but there's all kinds of different things to measure in space, which again causes us to need different tools. There are stars. There are moons. There are objects in our solar system, all the planets. <clears throat> uh, and there are galaxies. 
So the universe is very big. It's filled with many different kinds of things. Therefore, we need to use all different kinds of tools. Uh, and so we, we've we developed several of these tools. Uh, I'm not going to talk to you about every tool that exists because some of them are a little uh, funky uh, and I'm not really comfortable with them. I don't think that they're perfectly accurate. But but the ones that I'm going to show you tonight are, are very much um, uh, uh, certain and that we can use them very accurately. And all these tools put together is referred to as the cosmic distance ladder uh, and certain tools for close by things, other tools for more distant things. And this is just a diagram that kind of encapsulates it. And uh, down on the bottom, I'll just uh, remind you, if you might have forgotten, that one light year is approximately 6 trillion miles. When you're measuring the close by things, you don't have to worry about that. But once you get into the distant objects, uh, everything uh, is in light years. Okay, so um, we're going to start on the left end of the cosmic distance ladder, uh, the first rung, if you will. And uh, measuring the distance to the moon, our closest uh, object in the cosmos. And uh, some of you may be familiar with this. Uh, we landed on the moon in the 60s. It made all the papers in my town. And uh, so uh, when the first guys landed on the moon, 1969, they put this uh, device you see in the upper right-hand corner, uh, a lunar laser ranger reflector. And that square panel is filled with a special kind of prism, uh, the kind you see in the lower right-hand corner. And, and it's that, that kind of particular prism is one where if you shine a laser at it, it will reflect that laser back in the exact same di direction, no matter what direction the uh, laser came from. As a matter of fact, I have one of those prisms here. I'm gonna hold it in front of the uh, camera on my laptop and I'm gonna rotate it. And if you look carefully, I hope you can see this. Uh, can you see the image in, in, in the prism? Yes. Any yeah, okay. If you look carefully at it, I'm I'm rocking the prism back and forth, but the image really doesn't change much. Okay. That's because of the interesting optics of this particular kind of prism. That's the kind they put on the moon. So that from Earth, specifically at the McDonald Observatory, right down the street from us, right? Uh, they shine this really, really big laser beam uh, towards the moon. It hits this device. The laser beam uh, then returns right back to the observatory. Now, uh, we're pretty sure we know the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second. They probably know it to like 10 decimal places. And so, uh, as you see in the black letters, distance equals speed time time. Well, we know the speed. And then we just measured from the instant that we sent the laser beam to the instant that it returned. And that's the time. And then we were able to compute the distance to the moon. We kind of knew the distance fairly well, but with that, with this laser and these special reflectors, we were able to find out that it's uh, it only took 1.2822 blah, blah, blah seconds uh, for the round trip. Uh, you cut that time in half, and that comes out to 238,000 and some odd miles. So uh, this is one way, if uh, you'd happen to have a, a lunar laser ranger reflector on your object, you can get really, really accurate uh, distances um, to that object. Uh, of course, it's, uh, though that lunar range, laser ranger reflector is only one place in the universe that I know of. Uh, so that's the way to do it uh, really close with lasers. Um, okay, so, uh, but then within that first, uh, growing on the cosmic distance land, uh, ladder, uh, we can also measure the moon to close by objects like the moon with radar and even radio. So, um, you know, you don't use a laser beam, you use a big radar antenna like the one on the left, shoots a beam over to the moon. Again, it travels at the speed of light. We know that distance equals speed times time. They know the exact instant uh, probably to several decimal places when the um, radar beam left uh, the radar antenna. And then when it returned, the radar antenna collect, uh, records it. And then again, you divide that time in half and you know the exact distance to the moon. So a radar uh, can be used for close by objects uh, in our solar system. And as a matter of fact, we have used radar and radio, uh, which are of course very simpler uh, wavelengths on the electromagnetic spectrum uh, to, measure, uh, to measure the distances to many objects in the solar system. Right, the solar system is pretty close uh, uh, and on the grand scheme of things. So, all the planets you see here, asteroids, comets too, we have used radar and radio, radio 
to measure the distance to these objects. And as a matter of fact, it was done very recently, just this past December, uh, and, and they sent a, a radio waves from that um, a series of antennas you see in Alaska, and it hit this asteroid, asteroid 210 XC15, and then of course it bounces back, and the radio the the radio waves were recovered by this receiving antenna in California, and of course they were able to measure the exact distance, the exact distance to that asteroid at that time. I don't know what the distance was at that time, but uh, uh, it works, and it works in the solar system, so it works with all the nearby planets. And uh, that's another, uh, well, that's part of that first rung on the cosmic distance ladder. Uh, okay, so as, well, as a matter of fact, along with being able to measure the distance to it, you can use radar or radio and actually uh, map the object that you're looking at. Now, when it comes to Jupiter and Saturn, we don't have to map it. We can get pictures of it well. But this uh, just this past February, they used the, the Goldstone radar, which is a Southern NASA facility in Southern California, uh, to kind of map slash take an image of uh, whatever you want to say of this uh, asteroid um, that was uh, a million miles away. <clears throat> so that's not super far, but, uh, you know, the asteroid was a little rock. So so uh, you can do that with radar. <clears throat> Uh, all right, so the next rung on the cosmic distance ladder is uh, what was called parallax. Now, these rungs on the cosmic distance ladder are getting kind of strange. So to try to stay, okay, uh, I can take questions during or after, whatever you want to do. Uh, it's called parallax. And in this image, you get the general idea of parallax. You have two people just a few feet from each other, and they're looking at this tree that's uh, fairly close. And they're looking at the top of the tree, and the man on the right with the blue shirt sees the, the mountain on the left behind the top of the tree. And the man on the right in the, and on the left in the white shirt sees the other mountain, the mountain on the right behind the top of the tree. Well, you know, they're both right, uh, so to speak. They see a different view uh, comparing the, the tree in the foreground and the mountains in the background. They see a different view because there is a distance between them. And it's, it's just a matter of geometry, okay? And uh, that's called parallax. So that can be used not just with mountains, but can be used with cosmic distances. And here's something you can try yourself. Uh, don't do it while you're driving, but uh, this person, you, you uh, just hold your uh, arm straight out and your thumb up as it shows in the picture, and you don't move the thumb, but you just open one of your eyes. Let's say if your left eye is open and your right eye is shut, OK, you'll see your thumb close to the stop sign. And if you reverse it, in other words, open your right eye and close your left eye, you'll see your thumb moves much further away. I can't believe I'm doing that right now. Uh, you can't see it and I don't need to do that, but I just uh, out of habit, I'm doing it. But anyway, um, uh, and so this is similar to the guys on the tree in the mountain. And this also shows, so that you can do it yourself, you can see how it works. And why do you get two different views? Because of the uh, distance, what is it, four inches between your two eyes or thereabouts, I'm not exactly sure. Um, and that short distance between your two eyes is enough to give you this effect. Now, if you do your geometry uh, and your measurements just right here, you could measure the distance to that stop sign. If you know the distance between your eyes and how far away the thumb is from you, you could literally use X concept to measure the distance to that stop sign. So that's what we do with the cosmic distances. So fasten your seat belts. Here's how this works. <clears throat> so you have the sun here, the yellow thing, and the earth is the blue thing going in an orbit around the sun. Okay. And then uh, you see the arrow pointing to the red foreground star. This takes the place of the tree in the first diagram. And then, of course, on the right, there are many, many other distant stars that are much, much further. OK, so you want to know the distance to the foreground star. So you're going to use parallax. Now, the Earth orbit, you know, the Earth's 93 million miles away from the sun. So uh, the, the diameter of the orbit. Oh, by the way, can you see my cursor moving here? We can. Okay, so the diameter of the Earth is twice 93 million miles, 186 million miles. And so uh, instead of um, the distance between the two men looking at the tree, you take an observation, let's say in uh, June, up at the top here, uh, and you take an image of, the, of this foreground star. And in that image, you will see certain background stars. And then you wait six months. You can't do this all in one weekend. You wait six months. 
until the Earth goes around the other side of the sun. So it's 186 million miles away from the June location. And you and you take a, an image of the same foreground stars. And of course, you're going to see background stars when you do that. And if you look at the bottom of the screen, you will see, as you might expect, that the stars in the background from one image uh, um, they look the same because they're so far, their their uh, uh, location in the image doesn't change. But since the foreground star is so much closer, uh, it has different background stars behind it, okay? And uh, if you do your math right, uh, you can figure out the distance uh, to the foreground stars by looking at the amount that the foreground star moved against the background stars. And this is what uh, Bessel figured out in the 18, eight, what was it, 1830s, uh, whatever. Uh, <clears throat> and he started to uh, measure uh, the distance to near, quote, nearby star. This is good up to about 100 light years. Okay. Now, um, <clears throat> how good you can do, you do this technique depends on, well, the size of your baseline. And in our case here, 186 million miles, the bigger your baseline, the more motion you'll see uh, of the foreground star against the background stars. And also how powerful, how, uh, what kind of resolution you have in your telescope and your cameras. Okay. Uh, because sometimes this, the amount of, uh, of motion that you have of the foreground stars against the background is very small. And if you have very high resolution telescopes and cameras, you can uh, see th this effect better. Okay. And, and you could measure the distance to foreground stars that are further. All right. On the lower left, you can see there was a Hipparchus satellite was doing this. It could see up to 650 light years away. Uh, Hubble, um, because it has a very good telescope and a very good cameras, 16,000 light years away. The Gaia spacecraft, which I will mention towards the end of the presentation, 30,000 light years away. So this is a technique that has been used since the 1800s. Uh, works very well. It's very precise. We're we're putting it in our spacecraft so that we can uh, do this process here. Um, let's see. Is that uh, oh and and oh so uh, so what? You take the picture. You see the the foreground the uh, the foreground star moved in relation to the background stars. So uh, you you look at the angle the the amount that the foreground star moved between your two images, in this case, June and December, you measure that angle, that uh, how it changed in the two images, and you do the math on the left. The distance in parsecs, I'll explain that in a minute, is equal to one over that angle divided by two. No, I'm not gonna do that now. Um, but uh, so a parsec, because we're talking about big distances again, is 3.26 uh, light years. So one parsec is about 19 trillion miles. So um, you you take the two images, you you measure the, uh, uh, the, the the angle of the change as to where the star looks seems to be. Uh, in, in this image here, the angle is how you had to point your telescope to look at that foreground star. The, the two times, and that tells you the angle that ch changed. Um, and on the bottom, it says over there what a parsec is. The word parsec comes from one parallax second, and it means the distance to a star whose position shifted by one arc second from one side of the Earth's orbit to the other, or whatever your baseline happens to be. And an arc second is one thirty-six hundredth of a degree. So in other words, uh, when these things are very distant, very distant, they, the two images show the foreground stars moving very little, which is why you need high resolution telescopes and cameras. And so I know that sounds very easy to you. <laughs> I hope uh, it's understandable. It took me a while to get the hang of it. And uh, so this was a, a major rung on the cosmic distance ladder and uh, discovered in the 1800s. And we use it today on our most advanced spacecraft. So it's it's a very good technique. Uh, parallax. All right. So the next one, if you think that one was tricky, fasten your seatbelts. OK. Uh, this one has to do with a special kind of uh, uh, variable star called the Cepheid variable. Uh, they're called Cepheids because the first one was discovered in the constellation Cephas. Okay, so 
there was a, uh, an astronomer at the Harvard Observatory out east over there. His name was Pickering, and he was the astronomer, and he was taking many, many images through the very large telescope. I think possibly it was the largest telescope in the world at the time. I could be wrong about that. I'm not exactly sure. And uh, yeah, anyway, uh, so he was taking the images, but uh, he would take all these images. They were on glass plates, of course, back then. And then he had a couple of ladies. One of them was the lady you see on the right, Henrietta Leavitt. And, and her job, as well as the other people at the observatory, were to look at the uh, images and to measure precisely the brightness of the stars and their physical location also, by the way. And uh, so they would take the same pictures of the same piece of the sky over and over and over again. And so uh, most stars, of course, will have the same brightness this week as they will next week and next month. And uh, that's the way stars normally are. But they were able to see that, that some stars change in their brightness. They get brighter and they get dimmer. And and. God bless her. Henrietta Leavitt was a very careful uh, technician, observer, whatever you want to uh, name it. And she was really recording the brightnesses of these stars very carefully, uh, very consistently. And uh, she did a very, and, and she really paid attention. OK, so all the stars that they were looking at at one point in time were in uh, the Magellanic Cloud which uh, they didn't know what that was at the time. Oh, by the way, let me give you a little uh, preface here. Back in this time, early 1900s, they thought the Milky Way was the whole universe. Okay. Now they saw these things called spiral nebulae in the Milky Way, which they thought were in the Milky Way, which we know are galaxies. But uh, so they were taking images uh, of all kinds of stuff. The Magellanic Cloud is a small galaxy. They thought it was part of the Milky Way. And they were taking pictures of all these stars in the Magellanic Clouds. And because they're all in the Magellanic Cloud, they make the assumption that more or less they're at the same distance from us because they're all in the same group of stars. And so any difference in the apparent brightness must be due to their actual brightness at any given time. All right. Next. She, as I mentioned, sees that some of these stars' brightness changes. Now, if you look at the chart in the lower right-hand uh, corner, you'll see the, uh, this is the, oh, that's this is a chart from the very first uh, Cepheid had ever found. Uh, you will see that uh, the brightness goes up and goes down over a number of days, and how bright it gets at the peak and at the and at the valley is always the same. So you can see this uh, chart is very regular. OK, uh, in this case, it's every four, every five point four days, it'll hit another peak. So this is pretty odd if you don't know about these things. <clears throat> and she recorded all this on many, many uh, Cepheid variable stars. She recorded the uh, what we call here the light curve, the, the graph that shows it going up and down. And she started to think this is really strange. This is really interesting. She's recording them and she sees that the time between the peaks is very regular. They refer to that time between the peaks or the valleys is referred to as the period of that particular uh, variable star, the period. And, uh, and and so obviously, since it's getting brighter and dimmer according, uh, within that period, the period tells you what the apparent brightness is going to be, how the star looks to us. And it's, uh, they didn't know how far they were then, but they knew it was they were far. But uh, so the no, she saw that there was a relationship between the period and the apparent brightness. That was one of her uh, genius discoveries. OK, uh, now uh, nearby Cepheids uh, have an actual. Well, all Cepheids have an actual brightness, right? Uh, but for, if they're nearby, they could be measured with parallax. And um, uh, and so we know uh uh, we know what their actual brightness is. So then we can relate the period to the actual brightness. OK, and when you, you draw this chart, you look in the lower left hand corner. She discovered that the relationship of the period, the time between the peaks and its actual brightness is a straight line. There was OK, so that means I'm getting out of breath here. That means that if you know the period, you know how bright that star really is. And if you know how bright something really is and you see how bright it looks to you, 
Then you do the simple equation called the inverse square law, which I'm not going to attempt right now. And you can see how far away it is, all right? Comparing the actual brightness to the apparent brightness. And so when you see a Cepheid variable and you see its period, you can figure out how far away it is. Now, when it comes to measuring distances, this is a, an amazing discovery, okay? There's no doubt about it. Um, we'll tell you more. Uh, so, so uh, by the way, when they publish this information, this this might shock you, but she didn't get any credit for it. Only Pickering, the lead astronomer, did. But later on, uh, she did get credit for it, but not at first. So, we know how far away these things are. So they're they're looking at these objects, including the so-called spiral nebulae uh, in in the constellation Andromeda. And they show uh, that the Cepheids periods show us uh, how bright these Cepheids really are. And they do the simple mathematics. And it shows that that, bright, that spiral nebulae is 2 million light years away. Uh, it, 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 the way it's a part of the Milky Way galaxy. Okay? So it's not in the Milky Way galaxy. It's a separate galaxy. And it was not until then that they understood that there's other galaxies, that the Milky Way is not the entire universe, okay? Talk about a big discovery. This was huge, okay? And consequently, I mean, they were seeing in their telescope, there's many other galaxies. Therefore, the universe is filled with millions of galaxies, and the universe is millions of times larger than we thought, okay? So, yes, she learned how to measure distances, but this, the way they use that uh, information, uh, well, with looking at the galaxies, the spiral nebulae, uh, that just changed astronomy tremendously. So it was a big deal. And uh, like I said, at first she didn't get credit for it. God bless her. She did a fantastic job. Later, later she did get credit. Okay, so that's uh, Cepheid variables. And if that doesn't give you a headache, well, good for you. It, it took me a while to figure that out. Um, Oh, so uh, I already told you this. So in other words, they kind of figured out the universe is filled with galaxies. OK, uh, we're going to be talking more about that later in one of the later um, uh, rungs on the cosmic distance ladder. <clears throat> All right. Take a deep breath. Here we go. The next one. The next we first have to define a term called a standard candle. What that means is, as you can kind of see in the picture, imagine this uh, lamp at the top of the picture has a 100 watt bulb. We know exactly how bright that is. We know it's it's actual brightness, okay? And as you can see, there's three other lamps there. Some are closer, some are further. And the further one, of course, doesn't look as bright. It has a, a different apparent brightness, a different from the actual brightness. And then you use that same equation, the inverse square law. And if you know the brightness of the close one, you can then use the inverse square law to tell you uh, how far away the the dimmer one is, the one with the dimmer apparent brightness, okay? And so the close by bulb, if you will, is a standard candle that you can use whenever you see the same kind of bulb out in the uh, on the street or in the universe, okay? That's the concept of the standard candle, right? You have a standard, you can use it to uh, measure distances. So. We go to the next rung on the cosmic distance ladder, and that's called uh, a type 1a supernovas, which are exploding stars. You see our standard candle of the light bulbs on the left. Okay, the diagram on the right shows you what a type 1a supernova is. First, in item number one there in the left-hand corner, uh, it, 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 these occur only when there's two stars in a binary uh, configuration. In other words, two stars that are gravitationally bound to each other. They're in an orbit, uh, one orbit together. And one of the stars, the, the white one, is a white dwarf, a very, very small star. And the one on the left is, oh, maybe like our sun, let's say, uh, a more conventional star, not a white dwarf. And then you go to the right to, to step number two, the uh, star like our sun reaches the end of its life because it runs out of fuel. Uh, as often happens, it expands very large, becomes the red giant star. 
and the material and consequently it's still in the binary uh, orbit with the white dwarf but since it's uh, much much larger and the outer material on that red giant star is more loosely bound gravitationally to the star because it's so much further from the star and the gravity of the white dwarf, which is very dense, which has a very powerful gravitational field, starts to pull, as you see in the lower left-hand corner in step number three, it starts to pull material away from the red giant towards the white dwarf. And that material becomes part of the white dwarf. And that means that the total mass of the white dwarf is increasing. And as it turns out, in step number four, when that mass of that white dwarf star hits exactly, well, more or less exactly, 1.4 times the mass of our sun, again, this white dwarf is maybe the size of the Earth, give, give or take, but, but when its mass hits 1.4 times the mass of a sun, um, it explodes in a supernova explosion. And... Um, since it always happens when the mass is at 1.4 times the mass of the sun, the amount of energy in the explosion is always the same, which means the, the uh, supernova is always the same brightness. As it states there, uh, they are typically a, a minus 19 absolute magnitude, if you understand magnitudes. Um, but the point is they're always the same brightness. So... If we know how bright a type 1a supernova is in reality, because they're always the same brightness, then we look at how bright it looks to us. We look at what its apparent brightness is. Again, you use the same formula of uh, inverse square law, and you can tell how far away that supernova is. And some, And very often, where do you find stars? You find stars in galaxies. And so... Uh, if you know how far away that uh, type 1a supernova is, you know how far away the galaxy is. And it's a, and it's a, we use it very, very often. It's been used many, many times. Uh, it, uh, it Now, this is not the only kind of supernova there is. Stars explode for other reasons. But in terms of distance measurement, uh, the type 1a is beautiful because it's always the same brightness. So if it's in a galaxy, we now know how far that galaxy is. It's, it's a great um, technique. Uh, so you might say, hey, Bill. If you see a supernova, how do you know it's a type 1a? Oh, by the way, on the left, you can see here's a picture of one. Doggone it. Look how bright that thing is. It's brighter than the whole galaxy. Okay. But that's just the way supernovas are. Okay. So how do you know it's a type 1a? Well, uh, if you look in the, uh, the chart in the upper right-hand corner, those are the light curves you see on the bottom uh, scale. It's the number of days. And uh, the, the vertical scale on the left is the brightness and magnitude. <clears throat> And you can see the curve, how it starts uh, less bright. It, it peaks out at a certain brightness around 19, uh, minus 19 absolute magnitude, uh, mi minus 19 magnitude. And then it slowly uh, dims over uh, several days. In this case, it looks like 40 days it takes to, to dim. Uh, and uh, even though they look like they're all close to each other on the bottom, you see them sort of um, uh, averaged out, if you will. And you can see that the curve of a type 1a supernova is very distinctive. Other supernovas don't have this exact same curve. And so when you see a supernova, you measure the light curve, you know it's if it has this uh, configuration, you know it's a type 1a, you know how bright it really is, you do the math, you know how far away it is. OK, uh, an awful lot of people made an awful lot of observations over the last, I don't know how many decades to uh, put this all together. And it's an extremely um, it's an extremely usable technique for measuring distances. Type 1A supernovas. OK, so uh, I can't believe this is going by so fast. The next and last of the rungs on the cosmic distance letter that we will be discussing is, uh, discussing is called redshift. And as you can see in the purple letters there, this is something that you can use beyond a billion light years. As a matter of fact, we use this to as far as we can see an object in the observable universe. It's a great technique. So here's the deal. A star or a galaxy puts out light, all right? And if you look at it with the telescope and the telescope has a spectroscope, uh, a kind of a prism, uh, it will uh, 
in your spectroscope, it'll show you the the rainbow of colors you see on the right, uh, right? Uh, all the different wavelengths of light that are coming from that light source. And uh, it has specific patterns of these black lines within the uh, spectrum. And each of those, each uh, each element in the uh, uh, the surface of that star or in the aggregate stars of that galaxy has its own pattern of lines, right? And as a matter of fact, oh, oh, and uh, we'll, you'll see in a minute, for instance, each element has its own pattern. There's a pattern of lines for iron, a pattern for hydrogen, a pattern for sodium, et cetera. So you can see in the spectrum um, which elements are in that star or galaxy. All right. The other thing that we know is, uh, and this is where the word redshift comes in, that if an, a bright object is moving away from you, as in the top diagram, the light going from that object to you, to the observer, has its wavelength stretched uh, because toward the red end of the spectrum. Okay, if the object is moving toward you, as it shows on the bottom, the wavelengths of light coming from that object will see will be compressed toward uh, will be moved towards the blue end of the spectrum because they're being compressed. Uh, the red at the top, they will uh, look to be moving towards the red end of the spectrum because the the waves are being stretched out. The ones moving toward us uh, look move to the blue end of the spectrum because they're being compressed. Okay, and that's where the word red shift comes from. It's moving away. The light is moved towards the red. So, after all that, uh, that guy you see over there, Edwin Hubble, uh, he was pretty good. They named the telescope after him. Uh, he was uh, looking at lots of galaxies. He had a very large telescope in the United States. And um, uh, so he looks in these galaxies. He knows all about Cepheid variables. He uses Cepheid variables to measure the distance to galaxies. So he knows how far away they are. Of course, now he knows, you know, because they already found out they're not in Milky Way. They're separate galaxies. He takes spectrums of these galaxies. So as you can see, the pictures on the left. You can see uh, how you get all the different uh, pattern of lines uh, for the various elements. You can see that pattern at the top. All of those black lines indicate hydrogen in the atmosphere of that star or uh, magnesium or iron on the bottom. All right. And when you see those lines, you know that that element is in the, the uh, atmosphere, if you will, of the star or that galaxy. And then he found out that when he looks at some of the galaxies, the lines weren't where they should be. They were virtually always shifted to the red. Get it? Red shift to the red end of the spectrum, as you see in the diagram on the bottom. Uh, now, and then since he was looking at lots of galaxies, he found out that the further a galaxy was, and he knew how far they were because of the Cepheid variables, that the further the galaxy was, the more the lines were shifted. Okay. And uh, um, he, know, he knows about the concept of the um, wavelength of light moving towards the red. So he knew that the, these, uh, these, uh, the lines in the spectrums were shifting, was, that this was caused by the galaxies moving away from us at a high speed. They weren't just farther from us. They were uh, moving away from us at a high speed, enough to cause the shift. Okay? so. He deduced, as you might have figured out already, that the amount of redshift tells you how far away the galaxy is. Okay, again, because the the amount of shift was related to the distance that the Cepheid variables was uh, showing us. So, <clears throat> uh, and he sees that uh, the he knows how far away the galaxies are. He knows which ones are closer and which ones are farther. He learns how to use this redshift. OK, and he sees th that the uh, the distance that the galaxy was away from us is related to how fast it's moving. OK, and uh, and so he so well, first of all, he was able to use redshift to measure uh, the distance to galaxies, which are much further than we can use with the other uh, techniques in the cosmic distance ladder. All right. So this was an important a way to measure the distance to galaxies. We do it today. The Webb telescope, the Hubble telescope, and other uh, spacecraft 
uh, all measure the distance to galaxies using redshift. They don't even tell you how many light years or anything. They just tell you what its redshift is, and that tells you how far away it is. And of course, since he sees that they're moving away from us, and no matter what direction he looks at, they're all moving away from the Earth as if the Earth is in the center of the, of the universe, which it turns out not to be true. Uh, and he sees the, the farther ones are moving faster. So he's uh, getting on the idea of the expanding universe because all the galaxies are moving away. Now, there's a few super close by that were blue shifted, but that was a very, very small number of them. Uh, and so this was a huge discovery, not just to measure distances, but to understand the expanding universe. Um, shoot. So, uh, oh, uh, up at the top in the blue there, it says, if objects are really close, you know, the local motions, for instance, the Andromeda galaxy is moving towards the Milky Way. Uh, that um, um, you can't use redshift on local close by things. You can use you can, it's hard to use redshift with the, the moon or Mars or something like that. But for distant galaxies, this is the technique to use. OK, so that was the last rung on the cosmic distance ladder that I wanted to talk about. Here is a summary. Uh, we can do lasers to the moon. We can do the radar to the the moon and the planets in the solar system. We can use parallax up to 100 light years. We can use the Cepheid variables to tens of millions of light years. We can use the type 1a supernovas to uh, a billion light years. And the redshift, well, it, it seems like we could use it for the entire observable uh, universe, okay, greater than a billion light years. And... Um, uh, so uh, those are the rungs on the cosmic distance ladder that I wanted to mention to you. Uh, so I think you can see that because the universe is so big and because there's so many different kinds of things to look at, you know, you can't use a laser to measure uh, a type 1a supernova, etc. cetera. Uh, there's so many different things to look at. The distances are so big, it's tricky. Uh, the last thing I wanted to tell you is this is a picture of the Gaia satellite, which you may have heard of. Uh, it launched 10 years ago, expected to uh, function for another couple of years. It's at the L2 Lagrange point, which is the same approximate point that the Webb telescope is at. I hope they don't run into each other. <laughs> Probably not. Um, its job is to map about 2 billion stars using parallax. And of course, it's it has very delicate instruments, very good telescope, very, uh, very excellent camera. And so it can measure these parallax distances very well. And so um, uh, that's just out there right now. Um, and there's one last thing I have to tell you. Okay, you see this picture here. Uh, I was giving this presentation to a fifth grade class here in town. I don't even remember what school it was. And uh, I gave the whole presentation. I got a lot of great comments from the students. They asked a lot of questions. And uh, then I said, are there any more questions? And there was one hand raised in the back of the room. Now, this, this boy, fifth grade, he looked like a combination of Bonzi in Happy Days and John Travolta in Saturday Night Fever. This guy is who I wanted to look like when I was in fifth grade. And the whole time he was sitting in his seat with his feet up on the desk. OK. And I thought, well, he's not even paying attention. OK. He's just one of those guys. He's too cool. He raises his hand. I said, oh, you have a question? I can't say this without laughing. He says, you got to imagine how he looked with his feet up on a desk. He says, you got a problem. I said, oh, really? Um, I, I, my mind is spinning. I don't know what he's referring to. And he says, go back a couple of screens. Mm. So we go back to the screen here. And he says, you see where you say uh, parallax in the white letters? Well, you got a picture of a supernova next to it instead of uh, the parallax diagram. He was right. He was right. And I wanted to jump up and yell hallelujah. And God bless this kid because... One, he was paying attention. Two, he seemed to really get it and understand it. And three, he's opened his mouth and told me, you know, he's got to tell the adult expert in the front that he's got something wrong. And uh, I was so happy that he was paying attention that he understood what was going on. And let me tell you, I went home that night and I changed that presentation. I changed the screen. OK, and I'm very thankful to him. I wish I knew his name. I'd, I'd put it in the corner on the screen if I knew his name anyway. So um, that's the uh, 
it's tricky. There's the Gaia. And uh, I am open to questions if anybody has some. Great. Hey, Bill, thanks very much for the presentation. It was really well done and easy to follow, surprisingly, although you probably have to do a little study afterwards, but uh, great information. Um, yeah, so let me go back and look through the chat here. I'm I'm doing the Joe Califf chat moderation here so <laughs> if i don't quite get it right joe promised me he'd jump in uh i think our first question is from scott carnley uh scott if you would come off mute and ask your question do we have a scott carnley in the house yes yes can you uh, hear me yep can hear you yes can hear you um, so I know the James Webb telescope is able to do red light. Is the Hubble telescope able to do this well? Well, you just said the magic word, red light. Uh, anything that we call red is what we call a light in the visible spectrum. Okay. The Hubble telescope's primary wavelength is the visible spectrum. It can do a little bit in the ultraviolet which is in, you know, towards the uh, shorter wavelength. And it can do a little bit in the infrared towards the longer wavelength. But its main task is to use visible light. Now, uh, so can it see red light? Absolutely. Now, the web is very, very different. It is focused, no pun intended, towards the infrared light. Because, as we mentioned a little while ago, we know the universe is expanding. And galaxies put out lots of visible light in the visible part of the spectrum. But because of the redshift, if you remember how the wavelength changes when something's moving away from you, the light, the, the light that we're getting from those super, super distant galaxies that the web is now getting famous for is all been shifted into infrared. If you could only see visible light, you wouldn't even see them. Okay. And they knew that when they designed the web, I don't know, 25 years ago or whatever. Um, they knew that because of the uh, expansion of the universe, it's all the distant stuff, which is what web is supposed to be finding for us, is going to be in the infrared. you got to have somebody who can see the infrared very well. And so does the web see red light? Eh, not really. If you see pictures from the, the web and you see some of the galaxies look red, uh, I hope the the big shots aren't listening, but that's phony. Okay. What they do, what they do is they, it's all infrared. We can't see it. If they showed you an infrared picture, you'd see nothing. So they look at the wavelength of the light and the stuff that's more towards the red end of the spectrum, they color it red. And the stuff that's closer to the blue end of the spectrum, maybe still in infrared. Yeah, it's, it is still in infrared. But when it's shorter wavelength infrared, they tend to color it bluish so that we look at it. When we look at it, it kind of makes sense. Now, the scientists know what the real wavelengths are. They know what the redshift of those objects are. So they know how far they are, as we already discussed. But do they see red? Not as such. Webb sees infrared. Hubble sees visible and Never the twain shall meet. Yeah. And and to clarify just a little bit, thanks, Scott. You'd orig originally asked if if the Hubble could do red shift. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I thought he said red light. I'm well, sorry. He, 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 he did. did. I was going to. Uh, I back, just wanted yeah. to clarify. Oh, uh, red shift. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And it does have a, an instrument called the Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph, and uh, they're able to do red shift with that particular yes, tool because they can get a spectrum. But the you know with the wonderful explanation Bill gave, you, know, you could see the difference, or you can you know at least imagine the difference between the two telescopes and why, um, you know what they're able to do with the Webb telescope is uh, much more accurate and and is able to see much further in the past. If much further sense. because all that light is infrared. Yeah. Yeah. And I showed you one of my many talents. I'm very, very good at giving answers to questions that weren't asked. <laughs> <laughs> but I tried my best. Yeah. Thank right. you, guys. All right. Great. Really? Uh, the next uh, person with a question is uh, Ray Brogdon. Ray, if you're on, would you please come off uh, mute and ask your question? Hey, Bill. Uh, I'm a new member, and, you know, all this is new to me, but, you know, we, we talk about all these things, you know, thousands, hundreds, or millions of light years away. You know, 
at those distances, you know, if it took that long for light to get here, you know, I guess the question is, I guess it's just a guess, but you know, does that object even exist anymore? <laughs> yeah. Well, has anybody else asked that question? Well, <laughs> uh, it's sure that's a valid question, and there's no doubt that if you look far enough away, for instance, some stars are very, uh, very super bright, uh, uh, blue white stars. Uh, you know, uh, they, they won't last for very long. They'll last maybe uh, uh, hundreds of millions of years or a billion years. Um, and if we're looking at th that type of star in a galaxy that's uh, 10 billion years away, there's a decent chance that there's going to be stars that we're seeing in that galaxy that don't exist anymore. That's true. All right. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you have anything else, Thanks. Ray? I hope that no, answers your question. That, no, that, that's all. That, that, that makes sense. I appreciate it. All right. Great. Um, next question is from Steve Merriman. Steve, if you'd come off mute and ask your question, please. Oh, I was wondering, amidst all these uh, redshift measurements, we were talking primarily about the red due to a Doppler effect from the motion. And I'm wondering if gravitational redshift, especially around like supermassive objects, has to be corrected for when we're making those measurements. Uh, well, I think that the gravity can affect it. I don't think the gravity is big, but I'll be honest with you. I am unable to answer that question for you. That's a good, very good question. You know why it's very good? Because I don't know the answer. So uh, um, I know that there is some effect there. I don't know how much. I've never heard that it is significant, but I can't say anything more than that. So so can I add something, Bill? Don Selly. Sure. Okay, well, um, uh, uh, the gravitational redshift happens like in things like uh, supermassive black holes, okay? Right. So um, uh, if you're looking at uh, galaxies where you can uh, kind of uh, resolve the center of the galaxy and you know there's a supermassive black hole there, you'll see more redshift in the center of the galaxy than you will in the outer parts. There okay? you go. And that's a gravitational effect. So, yeah, I mean, they can, uh, 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 is, our astronomers with the good instruments can measure that. Mm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, in other words, the answer is, the short answer is yes, but you have to be able to, only with the super powerful gravitational fields, and you have to be able to, like in a galaxy, separate the center from away from the center. Okay, so that uh, it does it. And uh, I'm going to put that in my resume now that I know that. <laughs> okay. Uh, is Did that answer your question, Scott? Or Steve, excuse me. Oh, yeah. Pretty yeah. Good. Okay. And I'll, I'll also put in your resume that you got a student to ask a question. That's a... Oh, you that's know a, that's it, a real, man. Yeah, that, that's that a real old. milestone. Well, he wasn't the only one who had asked a question that time, but okay. uh, it was just his technique that was so terrific. Okay. Yeah. Um, I just know. I just spent a semester teaching uh, probably the most apathetic group of uh, dual credit uh, high school students taking a junior oh college course I've ever seen. But uh, I feel anyway. I, f I feel your pain. All right. <laughs> okay. Listen. Let me open this up to the floor. If anybody's got any questions, uh, come off mute and ask your question of Bill. I got plenty of time as long as I'm in bed by midnight. <laughs> Uh, and while we're waiting, Bill, I've got a question for you. My understanding was that um, the ancients, the Greeks, et cetera, were able to make um, measurements of the distance from Earth to the moon. It, is that correct in your understanding? And if so, did they use parallax in order to make that measurement? Uh as far as I know, parallax was absolutely positively not understood before the 1800s. Okay. okay. However, I, you know, they were able to predict lunar eclipses and solar eclipses are too, I think. Uh, and when I say they, I'm not exactly sure how far back that goes, but I, I'm pretty sure that the classical Greeks could do lunar eclipses. And possibly, let me think. It, it was no. using eclipses, Bill. Uh, well, Possibly well, they could use that to measure the distance, but I'll be honest yeah. with you, I don't know how. Okay. I well, think they were they're timing how long the the shadow of the Earth um, 
lasted on the surface or at least the, the visible surface of the moon. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, the the classical way, uh, 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 and I and I forget who which one it was is one of the mathematic guys, but uh, he knew that distance between two cities in Egypt, and they put a a, pole, a, a stick in the ground. Yep. And they and they measured the angle to the sun uh, at the at at noon in both cities, and uh, by the length of the stick, and and because of the difference between them. And they knew that the approximate distance between the cities, they used uh, geometry to figure out uh, uh, roughly the, the distance to the sun. Same thing with the moon. So I thought they, they used that technique to measure the uh, uh, the size of the Earth, the, the diameter of the Earth. Of the Earth. Well, uh, I didn't know they could uh, use it to measure the distances. Yeah, that it was. It, they flipped it around because they had measured the distance between the two uh, cities. Yes. Yes. Okay. I think that was Aristarchus. Uh, Aristarchus, thank it was you. Yep. Mathematical guy I was thinking of. All okay. Right. Okay. Listen. Um, again, I'm going to open it up to the floor. Uh, so if you've got a question, come off mute and ask your question. Hey, I was kind of wondering uh, back in the uh, Henrietta Leavitt day, uh, what instrumentation were they using to measure luminosity? Oh, you're going to love this. This is a, 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 it's a very powerful tool. It's called eyeballs. They, <laughs> they just see, that's one of her superpowers, was to be able to accurately uh, to differentiate the brightness of one from another and yeah. exactly how different the brightness was. And she recorded them. So she was just very good at her job, doggone it. And, uh, and, and uh, they had no special... Uh, a technology other than that to do it okay anybody else i we did one we did have question. a question oh i'm sorry i was going to say we did have a question in the uh chat from scott carnley yes um has any of these methods been used to discover exoplanets to discover well you know these are techniques for measuring the distance and an exoplanet is going to be going around a star right and so uh, it, it is perfectly reasonable to say, if you know how far away the star is, you know how far away, for all practical purposes, how far away any of its planets are. The distance is going to be trivial compared to the distance to the star. And as we've already discussed, we have several techniques for figuring out how far away the star is. So if you know the star is uh, 500 light years away, well, that's, what, that's how far away you say the planet, the exoplanet is too. Because, you know, we can't see exoplanets unless they're around stars. And so I, I, I guess the question was like discovering new exoplanets, I guess, if you know how far a star is away and you see its light diminish um, or its luminosity. Yes. Does that, mean, does that mean an exoplanet's there? Oh yeah. Well, it, it depends, uh, but almost certainly that is the, the primary way that they have discovered exoplanets by seeing the light of the star diminish. Uh, as transit. the planet goes in front of it, yeah. transit, transit, correct. Right. And yeah. so, yeah, uh, that's how they discover. Now, there is other ways of doing it. If the star wobbles a certain way, you can tell there's a planet there and how big it is and what its orbit is and some things. But I think the vast majority was in the technique that you just described. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Hey, Bill, last question since it's May the 4th. Um, did Han Solo shoot first? Yes. <laughs> All right. Okay, Joe, I'm going to turn it turn it back over to you. And again, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Back. Wait, wait. Oh, sorry, it's May the fourth. What's the question? Did Han Solo shoot first? Oh shoot! Give me a break. <laughs> I don't know Han Solo. My my wife, who who would leave me to go to Han Solo, uh, would say, but whatever he says is true. There you go. <laughs>